Welcome to Glass in Session. I'm your host, Val. Thank you for joining me. If you're a returning listener, thank you for clicking play yet again. If you are new to this whole thing, what I'm calling a wine potassy or strange booze trip, depends on the day, I'm so glad you're here. Each six-episode season is going to cover a wine region, a style of wine, an appellation, a grape, a spirit, or some aspect of wine or spirit production, or relevant cultural events. A three-part series on booze riots? I got that. Two riots per episode, and clearly I missed some, including modern riots that involve bombs in the last few months. And we've talked about wine caves, the history, the yeast, those wee beasties essential for turning sugar into alcohol. I've even done episodes on oxygen and one on wood. I've recently started theming the seasons and have found this to be a lot of fun and informative as each subsequent episode can sometimes play off of and enhance the knowledge that was dropped in the previous session. So this season, we've peeked into some French wine regions I personally visited in October from Champagne to Chablis and the Rhone Valley. And I thought we'd end season 15 with a palate cleanser. We're going to hit up the very French, according to one of my very French French teachers from Cop Dog back in 2010, Pastis. Was I actually given a homework assignment by the school's mistress to seek out said spirit? Yes, yes, I was. Did I report immediately to the culinary school's on-site bar slash restaurant to order up this traditional tipple? Oui, bien sûr, et tout de suite. Yes, I did right away. Thus, we end this season's French foray with Pastis. First, we're going to have some definitions, a little history. Then we're going to finish up with any strange facts or pop culture references, because you know I found some. And they, of course, only enhance the topic, whether you choose to partake of the spirit or not. I'm not going to give you homework to go discover this very French spirit. So you can feel free to just listen and learn a little bit about pastis. And we're going to start with the definition according to European law. Hello, booze law, my old friend. I've come to sip with you again. And according to EU law... Pastis is defined as follows. It is under the category of spirit drinks where we find our rums, brandies, whiskeys, etc. So kind of hard liquor, if you will. We find not only the legal definition of aniseed flavored spirit drinks, which has its own section, but an entire section dedicated to defining pastis. Bottom line up front, it is anise flavored and can only use natural flavors such as star anise, fennel, or other similar botanicals. Licorice fruit extract gives pastis its color and extra flavor. Pastis has to be at least 40% alcohol by volume, less than 100 grams per liter of sugar in the finished product. Now here's something I didn't know. If the pastis is labeled pastis de Marseille, it's going to have a higher alcohol content at or greater than 45% ABV, and it will have a higher minimum and maximum anatole levels. <laughs> Now we're going to have to cork dork it up a little early in this episode because here's what I said about Anatole in the absinthe episode back in 2021. If you have experience with this category of beverage, you'll notice that they are yellow or green and they start out quite clear. In fact, some of these beverages are clear. Only when you add water or ice do you see the beverage start to appear cloudy or milky. That milky opaqueness or cloudiness is called the louche. Louching is caused by that yummy aforementioned flavor compound, anethol. It hates it some water. The technical term is hydrophobic. The anatole's essential oils are essentially breaking out of solution. How do you like me now, Mr. Staples, 11th grade chemistry teacher who said I could not titrate my way out of a paper bag? Anywho, now that the anatole has protested being part of the solution, it also won't clump back together because it has low interfacial tension. In other words, there is little attraction or adhesion forces between anatole's essential oils and the water molecules. Alcohol, though, they like. Water can't be bothered. Maybe it's lazy. Maybe it's the Anatole. Or maybe the Anatole just has good taste. And speaking of taste. Now, since I went ahead and mentioned absinthe, this is going to bring us to the history of the beverage pastis. The world had lost their absolute minds and banned absinthe because of, oh my gosh, women riding bikes and, well dudes murdering their entire families. Now, I'm sure that consuming 36 million liters of absinthe a year, you know, overindulging had nothing to uh, <clears throat> do with it. But I did link up the episode on absinthe. If you want to refresh her on this and what dog flatulence has to do with any of it, seriously, I went there. And seriously, treat yourself. Anywho, the wormwood, the primary ingredient in absinthe, Artemisia absinthia used to make the absinthe, it took the blunt of the ban as it contains thujones. 
And this is a known neurotoxin that in large amounts, I will say, can do some damage. But it was never proven that there were enough through Jones in absinthe to cause the amount of insanity that was happening around the Belle Epoque. So I'll note that sage also contains through Jones and no one's banning sage tea or Thanksgiving stuffing. Just saying. This ban in 1915, at least in France, put a damper on the Pontarlier distillery that had been producing absinthe near the Swiss border. This distillery had been open since 1805. However, in 1928, the distillery known as Maison Pernod Fils, well, Pernod found a way to reopen this distillery because he created something that kind of tasted like absinthe, but really wasn't the same thing that was banned like 13 years before. But he, he scrapped the whole wormwood thing because it had a really bad image. He lowered the alcohol, he sweetened it up a bit, and this Anna spirit scratched the absinthe itch for the time being, and this, of course, was called Pernod. Then in 1932, a young whippersnapper named Paul Ricard, a very famous French family name in the drinks business to this day, is they even own some of the wineries I mentioned in the last uh, the Rhone Valley episodes. Well, this young dude of only 23 years old created an Anna spirit, and this one was dry more like absinthe. And according to my certified specialist of spirits study guide, it contained not only the aforementioned licorice root, fennel, and anise, but also an additional 48 botanicals. For years, there was a competition Competition. For years, there was a competition between Pernod and Ricard companies, but in 1974, 1975, depending on who you're reading, they merged to become Pernod Ricard we know today. People often compare absinthe to pastis, but there are some differences. As I mentioned, pastis is lower in alcohol. It can be a little sweeter, and they also differ by law when it comes to botanicals, where pastis uses licorice root in addition to other anise plants, where absinthe contains the mandatory, at least in the EU, wormwood. Wormwood is not required in the U.S., and again, you can refer to that episode if you want to get into parts per million of Thujones, Jones, etc. Both beverages are diluted before drinking, but we usually do a one part absinthe to two parts water, two or three in our house for absinthe. Pastis is normally a one to five ratio. So one part pastis to five parts water. And they do recommend you do this uh, without the ice. The Taste France article I linked up gives you a very well-written quick study on pastis and refers to it as the unofficial summer drink of southern France. Yeah, I get that. It's usually served in a highball glass. And again, ice, if you're going to add it, pretty much do it after you dilute it and it doesn't crystallize the components in there. Well, as my teacher said, this is very French. Also, what's more French than being so ticked off that something you love is banned that you come up with a replacement that's gained popularity and is still around nearly a century later? And there we have pastis. Not the long winding history you usually get with wine where the Romans and then the Greeks and then the there's probably some Etruscans and we have barbarians and pirates and monks. And yeah, we don't have all that here. This was very simple, very straightforward. We got a hundred year history on pastis if not even. I have some other interesting pastis nuggets for you. France Today tells us that pastis gets its name from either patisson, a Provençal word that translates to mixture like pastiche. Another cool thing I learned, and uh, not from Duolingo, thank you very much, but aforementioned France Today article, is that when you find yourself in a little bit of a pickle, you say, je suis dans le pastis, or I'm in trouble, or I'm in the pastis, is the is the uh, translation there. And then it mentions that there are more rude ways of saying that. And you have to know that I learned that much ruder way of saying it. I'm going to, I'm going to share that with you because I've used it over for a decade. Je suis foutu. I'm screwed because I pride myself on learning the bad words first, whatever language, probably a Freudian thing, but Hey, this podcast cheaper than therapy. Anywho, there's one more fun thing that I dug up very esoteric from the bowels of the internet. Have you ever heard of the pastis principle? In the EU, you might have. This refers to a political maneuvering, if you will, that is just as we see the luching and pastis cloudy at best. There's an entire research paper. Of course, my eyes glazed over at looking at it because it all has to do with uh EU trade policy and it's it's on pastis power as it applies to EU trade policy and international investment politics where, and I'm going to use a quote from the paper, potentially massive influence is decisively clouded by internal limits to its competence and the external environment in which it must find a place. <laughs> That's a call back to those Anatol's low fascial tension, hashtag am I right, hashtag do nothing Congress. <laughs> I linked it up if you want to read these things and your eyes don't glaze over when reading academic journal articles. Uh, the term itself was coined by former EU Trade Commissioner and Fifth Director General of the World Trade Organization named Pascal Lamy, L-A-M-Y. I hope I said that right. And what he was doing here was describing voting procedures in which, and I'm going to use a quote a, in a speech I believe he gave, a little drop of unanimity can taint the entire glass of qualified majority voting water. So 
there we go, the pasties principle. If you ever hear somebody refer to that when it comes to politics, it's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're making things a little bit cloudy here. Lack of confidence as well. And in conclusion, cloudy politics, of course, is going to bring us back to I need a drink at the end of this episode. Have you tried pasties? Let me know. I'm going to let you know now the glass and session is going to be returning on May 10th with a new season. And I'm thinking Northern Exposure, and that is going to be fun. But in the meantime, you can always reach out to me via email, Val at Glass and Session on the socials. I'm on threads, Vino with Val, same as Instagram. You'll see Glass and Session in my bio. Glass and Session is on post, post post.news at Glass and Session, Spoutable Glass and Session, Mastodon, Glass and Session at epicure.social. I'm Vino with Val on Pinterest and on Facebook slash Glass and Session. I still have the Wine Gal Unbox Twitter account. Don't really use it much. Blue Sky is at glassandsession.bsky.social. Starting to see more wine peeps show up there. And there is Glass and Session and yet podcast swag in my tea public store. Linked all the way at the bottom of the show notes and on my website, including the new Cork Dorkalicious teas, mugs, and other goodies. I have to post a picture. I'm wearing my purple Cork Dorkalicious tea today. Since I don't do sponsors or read sock and underwear ads or do Patreon, this is a small way just to fund the hosting and syndication of this wine cast and get some cute merch for yourself. My podcast, Smoker Doodles, and I thank you so much for your support. I will see you next season. And thank you again for a great 15 seasons to this point. We're going to be celebrating five years starting in May. I can't believe it's been that long already. Glass and Session is a production and registered trademark of Vino with Val, LLC. Music is Write Your Story by Joystock. Website is glassandsession.com. <music>